All right, welcome everyone. So I see the uh, live channel is working uh, because I've opened it right here and uh, I see myself there. So uh, excellent, and we've got a few people joining us already. That's excellent too. So let me just explain very briefly how this is going to work. Uh, basically, you, I'm going to go through the course materials for the whole course, everything that's uh, examinable, anything that we could have on the exam, I'm going to cover, I'm going to go through it one by one, and then as we go along, you ask questions, and you can do that by way of the, um, there's a, there's a sort of, it says say something right there on the YouTube channel, so you can just type whatever it is that comes to mind, whatever you want to know about, and I'll pause and sort of discuss it uh, as we get there. All right, so first of all, overall, you know the, you know the rules, you know how this works, so you have, um, the exam coming up in December and there's going to be six questions that you can choose from and you get to choose three so any three whatsoever there's no compulsory questions or anything like that so if you have uh, three questions well, well any any three questions you can do one two three you can do four five six or anything in between anything whatsoever now uh, four of those questions are going to be essay questions and two of them are going to be problem questions so you can do one problem two essay you can do three essay, you can do uh, two problem, one essay, Th those are the, the possibilities you have. And again, it's entirely up to you what you choose to do. Uh, mixed questions, I always get asked about that, that seems to be your favorite sort of question, are there going to be mixed questions? Um, there may be, I, I, I can't remember, but uh, obviously if, if you're going to do frustration, uh, it's going to... Uh, go into the area of, uh, of breach as well, because if it's not frustration, it must be breach. So you have to know about both if you're going to do a frustration question. Um, the remedies, the last topic we did, they sort of feed into all the different topics, especially breach. So in a way, you can't have breach without the remedy. So of course, there's going to be sort of overlap. Uh, that's quite natural, and that's not sort of intended to, to make life difficult or anything like that. All right, very good. So let's uh, start with um, the first topic we did on this course. So the very, very first topic, you know, when was it, 11, 12 weeks ago, whenever it was, uh, we started with something called mistake, mistake in law, and what is that and how does it work? So basically, we broke it down into th uh, three plus one or four different areas that, that we looked at when we looked at mistake. So what were those areas? The first one was something called common mistake, and then we had something called mutual mistake, then we had something called unilateral mistake, and then we had documents mistakenly signed. So as you learn this stuff, it's very helpful to try and remember it in that sort of structure. You say, ah, okay, this is mistake. Within mistake, there are four different things, or as I said earlier, three plus one. The reason being that the fourth one, documents mistakenly signed, is a kind of unilateral mistake, so it's kind of like the third one, but the courts have carved out a sort of a special regime for it, so we could basically say it's a, it's a fourth category. So in your minds when you sort of prepare for this stuff, you want to um, be prepared for, if it's a mistake, you go, okay, mistake does these four different things. So the first thing you do when you see the question, unless it tells you that it's common or mutual or whatever, the first thing, you say if it's a problem question, you sort of think, ah, this looks like mistake. But what, which one was it? So you know, oh, there's four different ones. So the documents mistakenly signed, that one's easy because you, you immediately know when someone signs a document that it must be that. And then the other ones, well, you know, they're sort of, um, they have specialized rules, but each of them is very distinct. And so for instance, let's just start, let's just jump into it. So the first one we did was common mistake. And we, it's distinct because common mistake means that both parties made the same mistake. That's what it is, and uh, the uh, if, if if you see the problem question, and you think, oh, this is kind of mistake. Ask yourself, did both parties make the same mistake? Okay, then it could be common mistake, and then we have to investigate further. Or is it that both parties made a mistake, but it was not the same mistake, and then it would be mutual mistake? Or was it that only one of the parties made a mistake? Then it would be unilateral mistake. So. That, that first stage is very simple, but it's also very important to sort of figure out which one is it. Okay, So once you've done that, then you kind of go in and investigate more into each area. So let's do that for common mistake. So remember, common mistake can be um, broken down into three separate types of common mistakes. So the two uh, first ones are very, very easy. They were res extincta and res sua. 
So res extincta means the thing is no more, the thing is gone. We had Courtier and Hasty where there was cargo on a ship and that was sold, but at the time that it was sold, the, it was already gone because I think the captain had just dumped it because it had gone off. So if the thing you are selling does not exist, then there can be no contract. And so the legal reason why there is no contract is called common mistake res extincta specifically. Res sua it means the thing is his. So you cannot uh, buy something that is already yours, which is what happened in Cooper and Phipps, where uh, a nephew uh, already owned a fishery and uh, he bought it or he rented it from his, his niece, from I think it was uh, uh, cousins or, or you know some, some relation. But it was already his. So how can you lease something if you already own it? That's not possible. So again, that contract would be void for common mistake, specifically res sua. Okay, those were very easy. So we spent most of our time on this talking about something called common mistake as to quality of the subject matter or common mistake as to identity of the subject matter. You can sort of use either. There's not like sort of one fixed term for it. So that's the sort of third category which was created uh, some uh, 100, what was it, almost 100 years ago in a case called Bell and uh, Lever Brothers. So this guy Bell, remember he worked for a for a Lever, Lever I should probably say because that then became Unilever, that's the company we know now as Unilever. So he worked for them as a manager and he was getting a lot of money. Now they uh, merged with another company, Lever Brothers did, so they wanted to get uh, rid of him because they didn't need him anymore but he had a fixed term contract and they had basically had to pay out his contract to get rid of him so they had a negotiation over that and then they uh, offered to pay him some money and he offered to go, uh, he agreed to go so you know you had a contract essentially a, a contract to dissolve the employment relationship that's that's in, in essence what it was now what is important about that case is because afterwards Lever Brothers found out that even though they were paying him money to go they could have gotten rid of him for free basically because he had done some uh, things while he was a, a director which he shouldn't have done so they could have just dismissed him right away but they didn't know that so the question then became is it is there a mistake here in this contract the, the contract being the dis dissolution of the employment relationship. So the contract whereby Lever Brothers promises to pay Bell a bunch of money to go. That's, that's a contract in and of itself. So is there a mistake there which would render that contract void? Because that's really the only way that Lever Brothers could get out of the contract. And what happened was that the uh, court said there was no mistake. Because the court said, what is this contract about, essentially? Well, the contract was about the dissolution of the employment. That's what the parties thought it was about. What did they end up getting? Well, they got exactly that, dissolution of the employment. So the only difference really is not the identity, not the main thing of the contract. The only difference is, is sort of one of the characteristics of the contract. So the characteristic would be how much does it cost me to get rid of this guy? That's a characteristic. Does it cost me, I think in, the, in, in, in Bell it was like 30,000 pounds or some very large amount, or does it cost me zero? Okay, that's, that's a big difference, but still that's a characteristic. That's not the identity of the contract itself. What, what's at the heart of the, 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 the contract itself is the fact that Bell would leave his employment and that's what they negotiated for and that's what they got. So there's no uh, common mistake as to subject matter. And so that was uh, sort of the, uh, the initial starting case for this third category, um, common mistake as to uh, subject matter or identity of the subject matter. And then we had a number of other cases that we discussed that followed from this. So um, we had, for instance, uh, LEAF, LEAF and International Galleries. You remember, the, uh, we, we, we talked about this in misrepresentation. We talked about it in mistake. So this is the guy who bought a painting, and both the buyer and the seller thought it was a, uh, a constable painting, and it turned out it wasn't. So is that a common mistake as the subject matter? And remember, the court said, uh, well, they, most of the case is about misrepresentation, but on the mistake part, the court said, what was this case really about? What is the what is it a contract about when someone sells a painting to someone else? What's the essence of the contract? And this is a beautiful case to demonstrate the whole concept of common mistake as the subject matter, because the court said very correctly, the, what this is about is the painting. That's what the contract is about. So, the buyer sees the painting, the buyer likes the painting, the buyer buys the painting, the buyer takes the painting. It's, ev it's all about the painting. So whether the painting is 
of um, was by a particular painter or whether it's a particular age or whether it's a particular uh, type of painting or uh, what a particular paints were used or whatever these are all characteristics but they are not the essence of the contract hence leaf again no common mistake as to subject matter and what you see pretty much in all the cases we did in respect of we had one or two exceptions but pretty much in all the cases we did as to uh, with, with respect to common mistake as to subject matter every one of them pretty much the court found that there was no common mistake as to subject matter because it's so difficult to show that the essence of whatever you agreed on initially uh, is no more because usually if you agree on something whether it's to rent an apartment to buy a painting or whatever you you end up with that y you might not be very happy with it for whatever reason but you end up with that thing so soul and butcher as well which would be the next case along so we had bell then leaf and then soul and butcher where the um this was for the uh, the, the, the the rental the lease of an apartment and again the uh, tenant got what they wanted, an apartment, and the landlord got what they wanted, which was to lease out an apartment. So in terms of the essence of the contract, everything was fine. There was no, there was no common mistake as the subject matter. But then, very famously, the court went further. So the court said, at common law, that's true, there is no common mistake as the subject matter. But we will now investigate equity, um, because perhaps at equity, it would be inequitable to let the contract stand. So remember in Solon Butcher, the, uh, at, uh, the issue was how much the rent was. Now normally how much the rent is, is a characteristic. A characteristic is not the essence of the contract. It's just one part of the contract. It's not the essence of it. The essence of it was renting the apartment. So the court said, well, because the landlord thought he could charge more and because the tenant thought he had to pay more, it would be unfair to uh, basically force the parties to continue with that arrangement, even though there is no common mistake as to subject matter. So the court said, basically allowed the parties to, uh, to, to, to get out of the contract at that point it was left to them to, to choose uh, and um, <clears throat> basically in equity they were able to to dissolve the contract to, to get out of it uh, or not and then it just continues so that the, the parties were given a choice so in a way you could say and this is not a sort of a, a term of art this is something we was sort of we, we could call it something like um, common mistake as to subject matter, that's what we've called the whole thing. And when we talk about equity in Solomon Butcher, we could say it's common mistake as to subject matter inequity. Okay, so then that becomes allowable. And um, when it becomes allowable, then of course you have watered down the principle of a bell, where basically Bell said if there is no common mistake as to subject matter, then the contract just continues. There's, there's, there's nothing else to be done at this point. So there was, Solomon Butcher was sort of a very attractive, and then we had uh, uh, McGee and the Pennine Insurance, we had uh, Grist and Bailey, we had a number of cases that followed the uh, example of Solomon Butcher, but arguably they did that, sort of, uh, that wasn't correct because Solomon Butcher Court of Appeal decision kind of changed the House of Lords decision in Bell. And then all of that was put right quite recently in the Great Peace case at uh, Zavrilla Shipping, uh, where you remember the uh, there was a contract for um, uh, kind of being on standby for a ship in trouble. So one the ship was in trouble, had to be uh, towed, but it was somewhere in the Indian Ocean. So the ship's owners arranged for someone else, another ship to come along, just to be kind of on standby, just in case things get worse. And um, they had agreed with the, the, a ship called the Great Peace, hence the name of the case, to come and do that duty. Now it was thought that the Great Peace was four hours away, and then it turned out it was something like 24 hours away. Don't quote me, but it was longer than four hours anyway. Um, the whole contract was to run for five days. So the court said, well, whether it was four hours away or 24 hours away doesn't really change the essence of the contract, because ultimately it is still capable of going there and doing the job which is to kind of help out and to to be be on call just in case something happens so the only uh, way this could have turned out differently perhaps would have been if the great peace could have only arrived there after six days okay if it arrives there after six days obviously it cannot offer any help whatsoever because the tug 
was going to arrive after five days. The whole contract was only going to run for five days. So then I suppose the subject, the, the, the essence of the subject matter, the, the root um, of the contract would have been destroyed and it, then it would have been a, a common mistake as the subject matter. But in the case it wasn't because it was only going to be a bit late as compared to what was anticipated. So with the great piece, the court basically said, that's it. We're not going to then go and investigate further or whatever. That's it. Now we're going to go uh, back to Bell. Where, um, the, the, and then this is basically the final conclusion that if you have a situation, you investigate whether it's a common mistake as the subject matter. If it is not, then the contract is alive. And that, that's the end of it. And so um, that was the case here. All right, so uh, that's it for common mistake. Let me just see, we have a few questions here. Um, the, uh, let me just go through them. Okay, one's misrepresentation. We'll go through that when we get there. Um, okay, then we got one about leaf. So the question is, would leaf uh, have been different had he brought the painting, had he bought it online instead of in person and hadn't he seen what he was contracting for? Absolutely. So if you buy something that you haven't seen, then you are buying, then it's, it's much more uh, kind of uh, explainable. So let's say uh, Leaf had bought the painting online, just as what, what the, your, 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 your colleague is asking. Um, it's, and, and you say, well, I bought it online because it was a constable. Well, then you could argue very plausibly that you only bought it because it was a constable, because that's what it said online. So then the description, the characteristic, really becomes the essence of the contract. It's not possible to say that, or it's less plausible to say that if you're in the shop, because when you're in the shop, you're actually buying the painting. You see it in front of you, but you're buying the thing in front of you. So yeah, very good question. And yes, the answer is the, the that that's correct. The, the outcome would have been different. Um, okay, so the next one is Associated Japanese Bank and uh, Credit Nord. Okay, so this is a common mistake case to do with a, um, a crook. So we had a crook who went to, um, to the uh, Associated Japanese Bank and uh, got a loan to buy machines. And uh, he was going to use the money to buy these machines and then he was going to repay and whatever the agreed terms were. Now, as is usual when banks hand out loans, is they reinsure themselves. So Associated Japanese Bank went to this other bank called Credit du Nord and it said, well, we, we want to reinsure ourselves in case this guy, the one with the machines, doesn't repay the monthly payments. And so that's a very normal arrangement, and so everything seemed fine until the guy didn't repay the payments. So then the Associated Japanese Bank said, ha, the guy's not paying. Now can we please uh, trigger our reinsurance and get our money back? Because, well, we insured ourselves against exactly this kind of thing happening. And then the Credit du Nord Bank said, well, um, actually you can't because the, the contract we had, that being the, the insurance contract, the reinsurance contract, is void because it involves a common mistake as the subject matter. And so she Japanese bank was like, well, how, how does that involve a, so, uh, 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 a mistake as the sub subject matter, common mistake as the subject matter? And the, the reason was this, and it, it, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. What's the subject matter of the reinsurance contract? Well, if the subject matter of the reinsurance contract is to, is the repayment of a loan, then okay, the, then the loan's not being repaid, so uh, that's what the parties thought they were agreeing, and that's what they ended up agreeing. So there's no difference, that means the contract is, is alive, there's no common mistake. But I think it's a bit too, and the court thought as well, it's a bit too simple to say this is just for repayment of a loan, because would you just get into a contract just for that? No, there had to be a bit more to it. And the more to it would be the repayment of a loan for machines or for something. At least, you know, you'd expect the reinsuring bank to know what it's about. And if you then frame the the essence of the contract as being repayment of a loan for machines, okay, that's what they thought they were contracting for. And then you compare that with what they did contract for, well that's different because what they did contract for is repayment of loans for, for nothing, non-existent machines. Okay, so there's a difference. So there's a difference between what the essence of the contract was when they agreed it and how it turned out. And so if there's a difference, then indeed there is a common mistake as to subject matter. So this is, I'm glad you asked that. This is one of the very few cases where we actually saw that the, um, the common mistake uh, doctrine did, did find application. Um, 
Okay, this, uh, the next question is about Lord Atkins hypothetical situation. So that would be in um, Bell and Lever Brothers. So what um, basically what, what Lord Atkins did is, is, is the, the famous sort of uh, paragraph that he had in there, which, which is all full of obiters. So obiters are things that the judge says which don't relate directly to the case at hand, but they're sort of hypothetical situations to try and explain the, the, the whole situation in, in sort of uh, terms that everyone can understand. So the um, and Lord Atkin basically went through and said, look, um, there's no common mistake here with the employment contract in Bell. Neither would there have been a common mistake if, you know, you were sold a horse and found out that the horse was, uh, was not well afterwards. Because you weren't sold a horse that's well, you were just sold a horse. And that's what you got. So again, you, you agreed something and that's what you got. The, the, the essence of the contract hasn't changed. And then um, there's a few more. I mean, you can go through the, I think we have it in the worksheets as well, that paragraph. But the, um, the, the really funny thing about the Lord Atkins hypotheticals is he actually says, you buy a painting thinking it's of a famous painter. And the, the seller and buyer both think that. And then it turns out it's, it's from a different painter. And Lord Atkins says, and this is about 15 years before Leaf, so he's, you know, it's just a complete coincidence that he came up with this example. Uh, and he said, well, the fact that you, it's from a different painter doesn't matter because the painter is just a characteristic. What the contract is for is the painting. So you bought the painting, you got the painting. There's, there's no problem. There's no difference between what you thought and what you ended up with. Um, Okay, so the question, next, the follow-up question is about uh, coming back to Credit du Nord and uh, whether it would have been a, a good case for um, having an equitable uh, remedy. Um, well, if there was an equitable remedy, then uh, I don't know. The what could it be? Junction. I'm not sure because it's really about money. I mean, it's it's really about the the Japanese bank wanting the money, the wanting the million pounds. Um, I don't think it, it even gets that far. Uh, with asking about uh, equitable remedies because there there were common law remedies available. But remember, in, in Associated Japanese Bank, the court said there is, in fact, common mistake as to subject matter. So if there is, in fact, common mistake as to subject matter, that means the contract is void. Well, I mean, remedies available in the sense that the, uh, at least for the uh, the credit ignored because they didn't have to pay. So uh, I, I don't think we, we had to uh, get that far. So remember, usually, the, uh, if you if you look at Saul, when the court says that on the common law side there's no problem, on the common law side the contract is fine, then you move on to the equitable side. But of course, on the common law side, in in uh, Associated Japanese Bank, the contract was not fine. Okay, so the contract was void. So you don't really have to go to to equity in that case at all. Um, but what I just said about Saul and so on, remember. This, is, this was going on for 50, 60 or so years, but that's no longer the law now. That was changed in the Great Peace. So now we're back at where we began with, with Bell and uh, Lever Brothers. All right, so uh, we got uh, two questions that I'll come back to. So there was the, uh, the misrepresentation. We'll come back to that when we do misrepresentation. And then uh, the which topics are coming up on the final exam. Well, uh, you, you will get a message, you will get an email. When, when we're after this week, when we're all done with this, with the, the teaching part of this course, at the end of the week, I will send you an email saying, um, you know, giving you instructions for the exam. Um, obviously, I'm not, obviously not going to tell you what's on the exam, but remember, there were uh, two topics that I had taken out. And I've taken them out of this revision session as well. So, uh, uh, um, illegality at common law, as well as restraints of trade. Those two are not going to be on the exam. And so uh, we're not going to cover them this morning either. All right, let's move on into. Um, oh, we've got another question to follow up. Uh, so, if in the contract they specified, for example, in Leaf that it must be a constable and it wasn't a constable, then it would be a breach of contract. Excellent, exactly right. That that's exactly what it is. So, um, common mistake only uh, applies when the parties haven't specifically agreed the, the the point that's now in dispute. So, obviously, if they said, look, uh, it's got to be a Leaf. It's a condition that it must be a leaf. Then, yeah. Then, if it's not a leaf, then it's it's a breach of a condition, which can lead to termination of contract. All right. Then let's move on to the mutual mistake. The mutual mistake is a very simple one. Uh, I mean, we spent a lot of time just now on common mistake. That's because it's uh, it's quite juicy and it's not so simple, especially common mistake as a subject matter. But mutual mistake is very easy. So, in mutual mistake, um, essentially what we're saying is both parties made a mistake. 
but it's not the same mistake. So this is this is the crucial uh, distinction. Not the same mistake means that one party thought X and the other party thought Y. That that's essentially what it is. Um, so we have the very famous case of Raffles and Witchelhouse. Always remember Raffles and Witchelhouse, the peerless from Bombay. Remember that was the ship? And there was a ship that was going to sail from Bombay to, to England and it was called Peerless. And the question was whether the, um, uh, the, the contract said your goods will arrive or the goods will arrive on Peerless from Bombay. That was what the parties agreed. But then the buyer thought it was the Peerless from Bombay that is arriving in October. The seller thought uh, that it, uh, the or knew that it was the peerless from Bombay that is arriving in December. So at the time of contracting, these people never had a meeting of the minds, because one thought it was October, the other thought it was December. So it was a, you know it was, a, it was a genuine mistake on both sides. It was not the same mistake, but the end result is that there is no contract. If you don't have a meeting of the minds, there is no contract. So that's a mutual mistake. That one's very easy. Next one then is unilateral mistake. So unilateral mistake is sort of, I don't know, sort of half easy, I suppose. In unilateral mistake, um, as the name suggests, you only have one party making making a mistake. So only one party makes a mistake. That's the first criteria. That's the first thing you're looking for. And the other criteria is the other party knows about it, which is why we usually have the sort of crook situation where someone, some crook, tries to rip you off, and the one who's being ripped off is making a mistake and the one who is ripping off knows about it so those are the two criteria one party makes only one party makes a mistake the other party knows about it so always look for those two so that can happen in basically two types of situations so we we basically break down unilateral mistake into two things okay the first one is a business mistake and the second one is a mistake as to identity. So those are the two types of scenarios that can happen that lead to unilateral mistakes. So let's start with the business mistake, which is, you know, the easy one. So business mistake is essentially where someone um, buys something. There's a business business transaction, and in that transaction, one of the parties makes a mistake and the other party knows about it. So when does that happen in a business transaction? Now we're not talking about a crook or whatever, we're not talking about some guy, uh, not the you know, not mistaken identity, we'll get to that later. We're just talking about someone buys something, the uh, the seller makes a mistake and the buyer knows about it. When can that happen? Well we had sort of two, two, scenario, two cases that uh, really illustrate this nicely. So um, that can happen for instance Hartog and Colin Shields where uh, the parties agreed that they were gonna, uh, uh, there was going to be a sale of hair skins and payment was going to be I think by pound so and so much per pound but then when they wrote down the contract the sellers made a mistake and they didn't say per pound they said per skin which worked out a lot better for the buyer so the contract then was signed and everything was, was done and the question arose as to whether that contract is valid or is that contract void for unilateral mistake. And the court had held it's void for unilateral mistake because clearly the seller made a mistake and the buyer knew about it. How did the buyer know about it? Well, in this case it was easy because they had previously talked about per pound and then later it became per skin. So the buyer who, you know, who reads it should have known that. Okay. The other example we had was Chu King Kong and Digiland Mall, or you can just call it Digiland Mall if you want to. That that's fine. In Digiland Mall, a buyer had bought something um, online, and it was very very cheap. It was laser printers, and they were suddenly, I think instead of three thousand, they were like sixty. Don't quote me on the exact numbers, but it was way 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 cheaper than normal. So the question became: Was that contract valid, or was it void for unilateral mistake? Now. Obviously, one party made a mistake, that being Digiland Mall. The sellers made a mistake. They put in the wrong number, 60 instead of 3,000. So then it came down to the second test. Did the other party know about it? Did they know of the mistake? And the court said, they mu that, mis that means Mr. Chu, he, the court said he must have known about the mistake simply because the price difference was so ginormous, so massive. So again, this contract was deemed to be void for unilateral mistake. So what you're really looking for here is, is it a mechanical error? Like did someone type in the wrong number by accident or type in the wrong word by accident, like in Hard Talk Colin Shields? Or was it a business error where someone kind of um, just, just they 
they, they, their business model doesn't work. They just thought, well, we can probably sell these printers for cheaper, but th it just sort of doesn't work that way. Well, then obviously it's their own fault. But if it's about sort of typing in the wrong number and the other party should have known about it, then we've got a situation of a unilateral mistake. Okay, so that's the first kind of unilateral mistake, which we can call a business mistake. The second one is mistake as to identity. This one is a bit more juicy in terms of the cases and so on, because that is essentially like someone comes to your shop and buys something. Now, you think you're selling it to Mr. X because they said they're Mr. X, but in, in fact, they're, they're lying about who they are. In fact, they are you know, Mr. Y, they're someone else. Does that contract still stand? Yes or no? That that's what we're investigating here. Um, so we got quite a lot of cases. We had the the you know the the usual case the cases the Phillips and Brooks and so on, where someone comes to a shop and wants to buy jewelry, and the the jeweler thinks ah this guy is very rich or this guy is very famous because they you know they have a false ID or whatever, and then they sell this stuff to them. Now the guy is not whoever he said it was. He runs off with the jewelry, sells it to someone else, takes the money and runs off and, and can never be found again. So does the jewelry owner get to get, get to have their jewelry back on the basis that the initial contract was void for unilateral mistake? That's the question. Now, they do if they can fulfill three criteria. So we had a three-stage test. So first of all, um, this is the most obvious one, whoever is invoking this, this notion of unilateral mistake must have known that the, uh, must have thought they were dealing with someone else. So in Phillips and Brooks, the jeweler definitely thought they're dealing with someone else. Um, we had another case for this, Kings Norton Metal, where they, um, there was a crook again, and he ordered as someone, I think it was called, he, he pretended he was called Hallam, but he wasn't, he was someone else. So again, both those cases, same thing, first test, first test of uh, unilateral mistake as to identity. The point being in, in both of them, whoever is relying on this doctrine must have thought they're dealing with someone else. Kind of goes without saying. Now, the other one is also kind of obvious. The other party, the crook, must have known that there is a mistake, <laughs> and it was pretty obvious because they're the one who are there's, they're the ones who are who are basically ripping the guy off. So obviously they know that they are not really Hallam or they're not they're not really George Bullo, uh, as in as in Phillips and Brooks or wh whoever. So the first two are really easy. So the, the 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 victim thinks they're dealing with someone else, and the perpetrator knows that they are that they are basically being being a a, a rogue or a, a rip off. So it really comes down to the third part of the test. So the third part of the test, even if you have the, the first two, that doesn't mean you have unilateral mistake. You need to fulfill the third part of the test. And the third part of the test is identity was of crucial importance. So even if you're dealing with X, but you think you're dealing with Y, that's not enough to void the contract. It must be crucial to you to be dealing with X and no one else. And here, remember, is where we have a bit of conflicting kind of um, case law. We have the Lewis and Avery type cases where someone sold a car to a crook. The crook gives a false check, gives a false name, and uh, kind of runs off and sells the car to someone else and takes the money and you never see them again. Now, in Lewis and Avery, it was held that the fact that the car was sold to someone who said they were someone else didn't really matter because what mattered was that the seller thought they were good for their money. It, it, it didn't matter whether it was Mr. Smith or Mr. Jones or whatever, it just, uh, I'm going to sell to anyone I think is good for their money. By the way, this is exactly the same as in, in Phillips and Brooks. So that's not enough to trigger unilateral mistake because the, the, the identity itself was not of crucial importance. What was cru of crucial importance was that you thought they were good for their money. That's that's different. Identity really means I only want to deal with George Bullo and no one else in the whole world. I only want to deal with Mr. X and no one else in the whole world. And that you, you that wasn't uh, you couldn't show that in Lewis and Avery. However, we also have Ingram and Little. Remember the old ladies who sold their car to um, a crook. Exactly the same circumstances as Lewis Avery. Just one little difference. The old ladies 
sent one of the old ladies went down to the post office to check the name of who had come forward to um, to buy uh, the car. So he, I don't know, he said, I'm John Smith or whatever. And they went, it wasn't, it was some other name. Anyway, they went down to the post office to check whether that name and that address exists. So they sort of, perhaps they took an extra step to find out if they're really dealing with that person. And the court said, um, in that case, they'll make a distinction. They'll say that there is a unilateral mistake because the old ladies only wanted to deal with that person. And the way they showed that they only wanted to deal with that person is that they went out of their way to go to the post office and check. Now, you know, we talked about this at, at quite some length. You know, we could, I guess, kind of split hairs over this, disagree uh, about this and so on. But um, I'd say let's, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, th there's going to be always a bit of discussion about the Lewis Averys on the one hand, on the in, and the Ingrams and Littles on the on the other hand. It's more likely that the um, the current case law is, is more on the side of Lewis and Avery. But you know, as a student, it's not a bad thing. You can sort of present both sides. You can say, you know, on the one hand, on the other uh, hand, that that sort of thing. It's it's uh, uh, it's not a bad thing. Now let me see. We have a few. Uh, questions here. So we have uh, okay, uh, mutual mistake. Sorry, I missed that question because we really moved on. So mutual mistake, does meeting of the minds, what the parties thought the contract was for, must be significant? How you decide it objectively to figure out if the mistake is important? Um, no, it, 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 it doesn't have to be significant. It's just the, the two parties had a and had a disagreement, which they didn't know that it, they had a disagreement, about something to do with the contract. Um, and uh, oh, it, it, it's got to defeat the contract in some way. I mean, it can't be sort of, uh, you know, um, you sell a house and one party thought uh, the, there's a little scratch somewhere and one party thought the other party knew about it and the other party, you know, that that's not going to defeat the contract. But um, Obviously, if you sell a house which is unseen, and one party thinks it's in town A, and actually the house is in town B or whatever, then 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 that that would be a, a mutual mistake. Um, next one is unilateral mistake. Okay, what we just did. The court assumes that the person should have known, even if they proved that they did not. Um, okay, so this is a very good question. So did you land more, poor Mr. Chu? How how does the court know that Mr. Chu would have known that sixty dollars instead of three thousand dollars is a mistake? Um, the common sense. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no golden rule to sort of figure this out. I, I think if it had been a thousand instead of three thousand, well, sometimes you get these kinds of discounts. So I think the court would have said, well, Mr. Chu, if it was a thousand instead of three thousand, Mr. Chu wouldn't have known it was a mistake. But if it's sixty instead of three thousand, he should have known. You know, it, it's. It, it's not 100% straightforward. You just kind of have to apply a bit of common sense there. Um, okay, how do you prove, next one, how do you prove that identity is crucial because the case where the old ladies went to the legal, uh, to, to the post office, uh, that, that didn't seem to be, yes, th that's true. I mean, um, was it really crucial in uh, Ingram and Little to the old ladies that the, the identity was crucial? Um, I never thought so, but, uh, so I agree with the, the, uh, the tenure of the question here, but I think the, the distinction we can draw, if, if we're going to draw one, is to say that on the one hand, you kind of have someone coming to your uh, to your uh, um, to your office or to your to your to your shop and says, "I'm George Bolo," and they 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 either don't prove it at all or they give you a fake ID or whatever. On the other hand, you have someone who doesn't just look at the fake ID and says, okay, who goes further, who does more, who says, hold on, wait a minute, I'm going to go out and check and do something. Okay, so I agree that the, the checking that was done in Ingram and Little is not very kind of effective because anyone could have gone to the post office and kind of looked up any kind of name, but it's, I guess they're showing that uh, an, an, a special effort was made. Um, Next one, could it be implied objectively that an individual intended to contract with the specific person in front of them? Uh, does it make a difference? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think the, the presumption in, uh, in most cases would be Lewis and Avery, uh, Phillips and Brooks, number of other cases we did. If someone's in your shop, the assumption is you want to deal with them, you are dealing with them, because that's the person you sold to. So you are dealing with that particular person in front of you. But the identity of that person, whether the person in front of you is Mr. X or Mr. Y, that's a different point. Um, 
you don't really care. So if you go to the uh, the shop today, if you go and buy your lunch or go to the supermarket or whatever, they don't really care if you're Mr. X or Miss Y or whatever. They just want to sell you the stuff. Um, one more qu a new question here to be completely clear. Where, where one party makes a mistake and the other party doesn't know about it, the contract stands. Um, yes, that's correct. That's correct. All right. Um, last one, very briefly, a documents mistakenly signed. Remember, this was a very uh, short and simple one, but we it's a kind of a unilateral mistake, but we had it sort of as the fourth category. So documents mistakenly signed, Saunders and the Angular Building Society. Mrs. Saunders signs the wrong documents, but it's actually the right document is just that the, the nephew's friend had replaced the nephew's name with his own name. And um, what we're really asking for is that um, there's, there's got to be two, you got to fulfill two things if you're going to plead documents mistakenly signed, which is also called non est factum. It is not my deed. If you're going to plead that, first of all, you have to show that you were not negligent. Like, I think Mrs. Saunders, it wasn't Mrs. Saunders, it was Mrs. Galley uh, in Saunders and Anglian Building Study. So, Mrs. Galley, I think she had misplaced her reading glasses or something like that. So, that's that's her fault. Okay. So, first of all, you have to show it wasn't your fault in any way. And then, you know, really, it comes down to sort of the Foster McKinnon scenario where the person signing is, is actually blind. Okay. Then you can't say it's their fault. The second uh, test is whether what they signed is fundamentally different from what they thought they were signing. So if, as in uh, Saunders, you're, you're signing your uh, house, your apartment over to someone else, and all that's changed is the name, well, then the document itself is still what you expected it to be. The document you signed is the same as the document that you um, you ended up signing. It's just that a name has changed. So the second criteria is that you it, it's got to be a different document altogether. So you're signing. You think you're signing a mortgage, but you're actually signing over your house, so something completely different than than what what you you thought you were signing. Okay, that's documents mistakenly signed. So let's move on then to uh, misrepresentation. And I see we already had a question there, so let's briefly set out what misrepresentation is. Misrepresentation is a very very straightforward topic. First of all, most important thing is we're not talking about terms of the contract. We're talking about things which are not terms of the contract. So things which are said by the way, you know, when you go and buy, uh, buy a car or buy an, uh, an apartment or whatever, and there's a lot of back and forth and chatting and so on. So what we're talking about the status of the things that that are kind of mentioned, talked about. The seller kind of talks about this, shows you around, shows you things and so on. So th whatever the seller said while he, while he or she was doing that is not part of the contract. But if it's wrong, you can still sue but you'd have to sue for misrepresentation. So there's these three requirements. First of all, whatever is being said or was said must be must relate to a fact, which is either a past fact or an existing fact. So it cannot be just an opinion. It cannot be uh, something uh, sort of uh, looking into the future or, uh, uh, or even a, um, a mere puff, as in, in carbolic smoke bowl. Um, so it's got to be a fact. You got to you got to express a fact in order for it to be capable of being misrepresentation. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's got to be untrue. That that's that one's pretty obvious, but you know, we had the sort of the Dimmick and Hallett situations where someone says something that's technically true. Remember uh, Dimmick and Hallett, yes, there are tenants, which was technically true, but it was also kind of not true because the tenants were going to leave soon. Okay, so that's a half truth. So half truths are basically lies for the purposes of misrepresentation. So first of all, it must relate to a fact. Second of all, it must be untrue. And then thirdly, perhaps most importantly, is whatever the misrepresentation was, it has to induce the contract. So just saying something that's untrue is not enough for it to be misrepresentation unless it induces the contract. And what does inducing the contract mean? Well, inducing the contract means because of that, because of what was said, that is why you entered into the contract. And, uh, you know, a famous case on this is Atwood and Small. Someone bought a mine. He was told the mine had a certain output of whatever the, you know, the number was. But he didn't rely on what he was told. Instead, he sent in his own surveyor to check it out. And his own surveyor came back and said, yeah, yeah, this checks out. So who did the buyer rely on? 
on the person making the misrepresentation or on his own surveyor. And the court said, well, he, he relied on his own surveyor. Hence, there's no inducement. Hence, there's no misrepresentation. Okay, so one, two, three, fairly simple. Let me see what questions we have on this. Uh, Kleinwood Benson, okay, so... Uh, Kleinwood Benson is, is, a, is a fairly complex case. We, let, 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 we can use uh, the uh, uh, Pancania case. Um, what it, what Kleinwood Benson and Pancania is about is essentially um, the first part of the test. It must be related, whatever the misrepresentation is, must relate to a past or existing fact. Now, it used to be before 1999 that if you made a statement about the law, that means if you said, oh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a statute, there's an act that says whatever, all of that would not be capable of amounting to misrepresentation, just simply because there was an assumption that everyone knows about the law. So if you know about, everyone knows about the law, you shouldn't be able to rely on what someone else told you about the law. And then Pancania and, and um, uh, Kleinwood Benson changed that and basically now the situation is that if you say something about the law, if you say oh there's an act and the act allows you to do it or the act does not allow or whatever it is, any statement about the law now is does fall under misrepresentation. So if you make a statement about the law and it is untrue and it in, 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 induced a contract then you have misrepresentation. Alright, excellent. Um, Okay, no, no more questions on this. All right, so misrepresentation, just go through your three-stage checklist, and then you know that the damage, you can get either uh, damages or rescission or both, depending on whether it's a serious misrepresentation, which would be fraudulent, whether it's merely negligent, or whether it's innocent. Um, then we move on to illegality. So for illegality, remember we had um, the... Um, Oh, someone wants to explain the three kinds of misrepresentation. Uh, all right, so the three kinds of misrepresentation are fraudulent, negligent, innocent. Um, so fraudulent, dairy peak, is when you say something and you know it's not true. You simply know it's not true. Or you're totally reckless. Secondly, negligent is when you say something and you think it's true, but you have no reason for believing it's true. So you're just being negligent about it. You didn't check. You say, yeah, yeah, whatever. You just say something, you're sort of careless, negligent. And innocent is when you say something that's not true, but you have a reason to believe it's true. So the, the classic example of innocent is you buy, a, you, you buy a used car. The guy tells you it's five years old, okay? The next year, you sell it on to someone else. And you tell that guy, innocently, it's six years old because that's what you think, five plus one. And then it turns out it's actually 10 years old because the, the guy from last year, he lied to you. Well, you're basically just relaying what someone else told you and you're being innocent about it. So those are the, the three types of misrepresentation. Um, okay, next question. Is experience needed when proving misrepresentation? Should the claimant uh, have known? Um, I mean, I, the, uh, I think this, this question is answered by the third test of misrepresentation, which is... Um, the, um, it must have induced a contract. If you should have known that what you're being told is not true, then it's difficult to argue that what you were told induced a contract. So I think that, that kind of answers that question. All right, very good. So when we move to illegality, um, there's a good point to remind uh, everyone, and we had this, I think it was the second question we got asked today. Uh, so the two types of illegality that are not going to be on the exam are illegality at common law, not on the exam, Okay, lovely area, but a lot of cases, and we sort of, I, I decided we're not going to put it on the exam for that reason. And the other one that's not going to be on the exam is restraint of trade. Okay, so those two are not on the exam. So that leaves illegality under statute. Now, I don't know if it's on the exam, but it may be. Okay, so illegality under statute is basically uh, something called express illegality or implied illegality. Express illegality happens where someone has expressly uh, so someone has a contract or two people get into a contract which expressly is prohibited under a statute. So we had the, uh, always you know, think of the Mahmoud Ispahani, the linseed oil. So there's a statute that says if you want to buy and sell linseed oil, you need a license. So the statute itself prohibits the buying and selling. So if you still go ahead, then you are acting uh, illegally under the statute expressly. So that one's simple. 
The implied one is where the statute itself does not say it's illegal. The statute itself is, um, is sort of indirect. So we had a few cases. We had two pairs of cases. So we had the broker cases, and then we had the, uh, uh, the, 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 the transport, the shipping kind of cases. So the broker cases, we had Leroy and Bracken and Cope and Rowland. So Leroy and Bracken, remember, this was the, the, the broker who had a license and did everything they were supposed to do. But, you know, when they, when they uh, uh, brokered a, a buying of shares, they were supposed to put a stamp on it to, to, to represent the stamp duty and then kind of it moves on. And they didn't put the stamp on it. Is that illegal, illegal under statute? Is that impliedly illegal under statute? So you, the question you have to ask yourselves is, what's the purpose of the statute that says you have to put a stamp on each sale of shares? And the purpose, as the court held, was to gain money. It was a tax revenue kind of thing. So it was not to render the entire contract void, which would have been the result if it had been illegal under statute. It was simply to gain taxes. So there was no implied illegality. Whereas in Cope and Rowlands, the stockbroker didn't even have a license. So if the stockbroker doesn't have a license, you think, what's the purpose of the, the statute that says stockbrokers need a license? Is it to raise money? Well, it could be. But uh, in this case, the court held it was in a way to protect consumers and protect the public from entering into contracts with people who didn't have a license. So there, the, the court held that um, acting without a license is indeed uh, renders the contracts that you, you, you then uh, um, enter into illegal under statute and hence void. Okay, so that, those are the two stockbroker cases. We also had the, the shipping cases. So we had um, St. John shipping, where the ship was overloaded, uh, and we had Ashmore and Dawson, where the truck was overloaded. So um, here it really depends on whether it was incidental or whether it was not incidental. So in St. John shipping, there was a ship that was loaded and it was, I don't know, it was, I had to say 100 co uh, containers, 100 crates, whatever, and uh, there was just a few too many, so the ship was overloaded. And one of those um, belonged to uh, Rank, who, who said, hey, you overloaded your ship, so the contract is, uh, is illegal, it's void, I'm not paying. But the court held that the overloading was just incidental. So, in other words, you could have carried out the transport without the overloading. That would have been possible. All that would have had to have been done is just take a few less crates. So no illegality under statute because it was incidental. However, in Ashmore and Dawson, the truck was overloaded with the, the, the big machines. And in fact, the machines were too big for the truck under any circumstances. Because, you know, let's to use simple numbers. Let's say the truck is licensed to carry 10 tons. And in fact, the machines are 15 tons or so whatever. So whatever you do you cannot transport those machines on those trucks legally that's not possible so there the illegality under statute the implied illegality in the statute was not as in in st john shipping it was not incidental but rather it was material so the contract was void for illegality under statute all right um okay we don't have questions on this so i'll just give you a couple of moments um what I say is, uh, I know some of you might have to go because we're coming up to 10 o'clock here. Uh, but if you, um, I'll just I'll just continue with this this recording anyway for the for the benefit of everyone. So if you do have to kind of uh, move on, that's fine, and um, you just watch it later. It will be it will be on YouTube. I'll send you the link. So the next thing we uh, then and but by the way. If you do have to go, just if you have any questions that you already know of, just post them now, and then I'll, I'll get into them, and you can watch them on the recording later on. Um, the next topic then that we did was breach of contract. So breach of contract is, again, a fairly straightforward topic. You have um, essentially these four different types of breaches, and uh, each of them has its rules and its cases, and you just kind of learn how it works. And the first one is obviously breach of a condition, then we had breach of warranty, breach of an innominate term, and then the fourth category would be anticipatory breach. Okay, those very straightforward from, from, from that perspective. So a breach of contract, breach of a condition, first of all, condition means something that's very important, something that goes to the root of the contract, the essence of the contract. And when I say essence of the contract, you can really compare this to the essence we talked about earlier in respect of mistake. What's at the root of the contract? It's the same question. 
So if someone breaches something that goes to the root, is at the heart of the contract, then it's a breach of a condition. And if it's a breach of a condition, that means you can terminate the contract. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. That's why it's important to know which ones are conditions, because those are the ones that allow you to terminate. We had the case of Poussard and Spears, where you know the singer, remember, she wasn't able to show up for the first couple of uh, performances, and the uh, Spears and Pond, the theater people, they hired someone else. And they said the contract is done, it's terminated because of breach of condition. So the court basically had to decide, not showing up for your um, performance, is that a breach of a condition or is that less? And the court said, well, that's the heart of the contract. The performance is the heart of the contract. So you got to uh, show up. If you don't show up, uh, that's, that's a breach of a condition. And that means the, the termination was valid. So Spears was able to terminate and that was okay. Whereas on the other hand, remember Bettini and Guy, this is, a, this is the singer who didn't show up for his rehearsals. And the court said, well, that does not go to the root of the contract. That's less than, 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 a, than a condition. Um, obviously, this is Poussard is a very old case. Nowadays, people would just use the word condition. They would say, it is a condition. They would write that into the contract. And if you say that, then usually it will be a condition. But just be a bit careful because you know, we had Schuller and Wickman tools. In Schuller and Wickman tools, the court said it is not a condition even though they said it was a condition. And the reason why they, why they said that was because um, the, uh, it, it wasn't clear that the people, even though they'd used the word condition, it wasn't 100% clear that they knew exactly what they, what they were doing. Um, so on this note, two things. If you use the word condition and the contract is done by lawyers, then the assumption is, okay, they knew what they were doing. So it is really a condition. The other thing is, if you write a con if there's a contract that uses the word condition but it's not done by lawyers and Schuller and Wickman tells us the courts will kind of keep it open as to whether it is the way you can make sure that it really is a condition is not only by calling it a condition so that's the first thing you do and the second thing you do is you say what happens if there's a breach and so we have Union Eagle for this the Union famous Union Eagle Privy Council case where the party said the payment for the apartment has to be made by 5 p.m. on a certain date. That is a condition. That's what the party said. They used the word condition. And they also said, if the payment is late, that allows the seller to terminate. So they used the word terminate. They did both things, condition as well as consequences, terminate. So by doing both, the courts won't question it, no matter what. The courts will say, OK, the parties agreed. That's it. And uh, so this led to this exa example in, in uh, Union Eagle where the, the payment was literally 10 minutes late. It wouldn't have made any difference in, the, you know, in, in, any, in any significant way. But the court said, because you agree that even one minute late is too late, we're going to say this is uh, the, the, the contract was properly terminated because of the lateness. Then we had... Um, Warranties. So warranties, by doing conditions, we've basically already done warranties. So warranties are what ha are essentially what happens when you have a term which is less than a condition. So if you breach the term, you might have to pay damages, but you the other party cannot terminate. So and we had we already talked about Bettini and Guy. So Guy was not able to terminate the contract with the singer Bettini because all that Bettini did was he missed the rehearsals. He didn't miss the actual performance. So that was no good reason to terminate. It was just a reason to ask, say, for, for damages, but not to terminate. So that's the difference between a condition and a warranty. And then thirdly, we have these innominate terms, which is a beautiful concept, but as we found, it's not so uh, kind of, uh, uh, hasn't had the impact we, people might have expected in the real world. So this is the Hong Kong for a shipping case. In the Hong Kong for a shipping case, there was a clause in the contract that said that the uh, ship had to be seaworthy, seaworthy. That was the word used. And seaworthy is a nice, nice example of this because seaworthy could mean, uh, you know, the ship is about to sink. That would be very serious. Or seaworthy might mean, uh, you know, we didn't bring all the 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 maps we should have, or we didn't, we didn't, we don't have enough life vests on board, or whatever, which um, is, you know, less of a problem and can be easily remedied. So the question then was, what is seaworthy? Is that uh, the 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 clause that the ship has to be seaworthy. Is that a condition or is that a warranty? And the court basically said that um, it's not knowable. 
It's just not knowable. Even if the parties had thought about this beforehand, they wouldn't have known. So in other words, you don't know if it's something serious or something minor until it actually happens, until the breach happens. So in nominate terms, <coughs> which by their name, in nominate, they have no name, in nominate terms are those terms where we do not know what the uh, uh, whether they are they, they have serious or minor consequences until the breach happens. So they become in nominate terms with serious consequences, or they become in nominate terms with minor consequences once there's a breach. Before there's a breach, they kind of just exist in a you know in a state of of they're they're both. Then they're not one or the other. It hasn't crystallized yet. So that's the idea of a in nominate term. Beautiful idea, and uh, you know great. Um, sort of logical concept, great case, Hong Kong for shipping. But then what's the practical application? Well, in, in reality, as you know, what, is, what we've seen since, since 19, the 1960s when this case happened, was that parties now, businesses don't like this sort of unpredictability where, oh, it's un innominate. And businesses don't like that. Businesses want to know, they want to know, is it this or is it that? You know, you just want to know. So what the, uh, what the courts have done is uh, if you look through, you know, if you go to LexisNexis and you look for the innominate term, you don't find a lot of references to it. There's not, there's not much on it, and certainly not in the past sort of 30, 40 years. And that's because parties, the parties to the contract, would nowadays just determine everything beforehand. They would just write everything down. They would say, uh, if there is this problem with the ship, then it's a condition. If there is this problem, then it's a warranty. If they, they just write it all down. By writing it all down, you, you don't run the risk of having the court decide it for you. That's, that's the consequence. So, you know, in Mihalis Angelos, the parties had agreed, for instance, they wrote it down, that it is a condition that the ship must not be late. If the ship is late, then the shipper can terminate. Now, as it turned out, the ship was late, but at the same time, the shipment wasn't ready. So it was essentially a breach with no consequences. So the, the, um, the, 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 the ship owners argued, hey, if it's a breach without consequences, then it's got to be an innominate term because we wouldn't have known about the consequences, whether they're serious or minor, until the breach happens. And the court says, yes, looking at it that way, it is an innominate term. It has all the characteristics of an innominate term, but it's not innominate because the parties had previously agreed that if the ship was late, this was a breach of a condition. So that's how you avoid uh, being subject to this concept of the innominate term. All right, and lastly, under breach of contract, we had something called uh, anticipatory breach. So technically, this is not really a breach because what it means is if someone tells you before they were supposed to do something, they tell you, I'm not going to do it, then can you quit the contract then? So Hotster de la Tour, kind of our leading early case on this, 170 years old or so. Um, you had a guy, a courier, who was going to accompany this, this nobleman, De La Tour, uh, so Hotster was going to accompany De La Tour on a, on a European trip. He was going to be a courier, he was going to work for him. Before the trip was going to start, that means before Hotster was to, supposed to show up for duty, De La Tour told him, I'm not, we, don't, we no longer need you. The question then becomes, can you quit the contract then, or do you have to wait for the breach? If you have to wait for the breach, then you then Hodgster would have had to have waited for a few more weeks or whatever, and then could have sued. And of course, that's silly. You don't have to wait. You can sue right away because you're already told there will be uh, there, there will be a breach. So you're the, the anticipatory breach. The breach hasn't happened yet, but you know it's going to happen sort of down the road. Basically, you have two options. You can ignore the breach, or you can terminate immediately. Those those are your two options. Um, Let's see what we got here. A uh, couple of questions. Doesn't a condition, whether expressed or implied, require that there to be a statement as to what happens if it is breached? Uh, <coughs> no, um, it doesn't. I mean, uh, if, if you call it a condition, it's probably going to be a condition. To make sure that the courts will, will, will agree it is a condition, you've got to do both things. Call it a condition, number one, and then number two, do what you're saying here, say that the consequence is termination. Do both, okay? That's to be sure.
But if you don't do those things, it doesn't mean it's not a condition. You can have something in a contract which doesn't even mention the word condition, which doesn't mention consequences. But it would still, if it was at the, it was if it was the at, at the heart of the contract, the courts would still say, hey, this is this is essential. This is a breach of something very fundamental, and it would still be a condition. So. The, the two-part test that I just talked about is just to make sure that the courts will agree. If you don't do that, it's, it still could be a condition, but you just then, you basically you leave yourselves, uh, yourself open to the, uh, the court's interpretation on this. Um, next one is, can you explain quantum merit? Okay, well, we'll get there in a moment. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, what is the remedy for an innominate term? Okay, so the remedy for an innominate term is if it's an innominate breach, uh, sorry, if it's an, uh, a, a breach of an innominate term with serious consequences, then the remedy is termination. If it's, the, uh, if it's a, a breach of an innominate term with minor consequences, the breach is, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the remedy is damages. So essentially, you can imagine the two as being conditions and warranties, but don't use those words. So, because it's not, it's an innominate term. So, an innominate term with serious consequences is like a condition. On the other hand, an innominate term with minor consequences is like a warranty. All right, very good. So we'll come back to quantum merit uh, in a moment, but let's do frustration first. So frustration again, nice kind of topic, topic out of its own, very. Uh, easy, well, not, not sure it's easy, but a very uh, plausible, very easy to kind of remember three-part test and a nice sort of historical uh, development. So remember, in the past, there was no frustration. There was, this concept didn't exist, Paradigm and Jane. The court said, look, if, if you guys, uh, if something happened, the, the music hall burned down or whatever, you should, have contra you should have written that down in your contract. You should have written down in your contract, if things go wrong, this and this will happen. You didn't write it in your contract, tough luck. It's not, not the job of the courts to do anything. And then that was changed in Taylor and Caldwell, with, where in fact the music hall had burned down. And the court said, look, if the music hall burns down, that is a change in circumstances. If it wasn't the fault of the parties that the music hall burned down, then the contract comes to an end because of frustration. So you kind of had a two-stage test. And then that was 1863. And then for about a hundred years, that was the law. You had this two-stage test. But at times you would have thought, hmm, this is a bit, uh, there were certainly cases where it almost became too easy to get out of a contract because all you'd have to show is there was a, a change in circumstances, it wasn't anyone's fault, bang, contract comes to an end. And that's why you had Davis. So Davis came in in 1956, <coughs> Davis Contractors and Ferrum, and Davis Contractors and Ferrum said, look, you need to show three things. First of all, there's a change in circumstances. Okay, we already did that. Second of all, it wasn't the fault of any of the parties. Okay, we did that too. But thirdly, there must have also been a change in the obligation. So how is the change in circumstances different from the obligation? Well, you can always think of um, the, the, the different sort of shipping cases. Um, if you have a, a um, a contract that says this this crate this container will be brought a transport contract from A to B okay the circumstances that might change in respect of that contract is that one of the shipping routes say you know the Suez Canal or whatever is shut okay then the circumstances have changed and it's not the fault of either of the parties but has the obligation changed and you see the obligation is to bring the contract bring the goods from A to B. That's the obligation. The obligation is not to do it via a particular route. The obligation is to just get the stuff from A to B. So uh, the obligation may still be fulfilled even if there is uh, a hardship, even if it costs a lot more, if there's a lot of... Is, oh, any number of, of, of uh, you know, especially you know, it costing more, any number of things might happen, but you still have that obligation. So that's the three-part test in, uh, in Davis Fairham. So change in circumstances, not the fault of the parties, but also, thirdly, a change in the underlying obligation. And that's the, that's the tough one. That's the tough one to, to show. Um, okay, the question on remedies is whether you have to discuss Paradigm and Jane. Well, uh, Paradigm and Jane is, is uh, if, if you have a question on sort of the historical development uh, or, uh, you know, uh, 
was if you have a question about whether frustration was always the way it is now obviously the answer is no because of what we just discussed sure I mean if, if for those kinds of more academic type essay type questions you'd have to know about Paradine and Jane if you're just doing a problem question then you don't have to know about Paradine and Jane you don't even have to know about uh, Taylor and Coldwell strictly speaking because the the law as of the moment is Davis contract isn't fair so if it's a problem question you apply the law as it is so you use Davis uh, and Ferrum for that um, all right, and then we move to the last topic, which is remedies. So remedies, we basically had three types. We had the common law remedies, we had the equitable remedies, as well as the quasi-contractual remedies. So those were the three types, and that we that uh, that that would bring us to an end once we're once we've gone through those. So the the general concept is if um, common law uh, uh, remedies can fix the problem. That means if money, the common law remedies are damages. If money can fix the problem, money will fix the problem. Okay, Flint and Brandon. Remember, there was the uh, um, uh, there was a gravel pit, which was a, was a, there was a big hole, and if someone was supposed to fill it up with gravel and, and sort of even it out, they didn't do that. Now you have two options as a court. You can say, well, I will force the person who said he would do it to do it. That's option one. Option two is I won't force anyone to do anything, but if the person who promised to do it doesn't do it they have to pay money, damages. So the court held that in this case it would be damages and the court, court held generally that it would always be damages if damages can fix the problem. So that's basically your first option with, with anything. If damages, money, can fix the problem, it has to be money. You don't go to the equitable remedies. So basically common law remedies is money, damages, and uh, what's the point of, what, what are you, where, where are you trying to get? Well, you're trying to get to a point where, what would have been the situation had there been no breach? Okay, that's Robinson and Hartman. Hartman. Always ask yourselves, what if there had been no breach? What position would the parties have been in had there been no breach? So if, uh, you know, if there was, a, 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 like with the gravel pit and Flint and Brandon, if there, was, if there had been no breach, then the, uh, the, there would now be a nice evened out gravel pit, okay? So someone would have filled it up. So how do we put parties in a position as if that had happened? Well, by awarding money to let someone else do it, and then the end result is that there is that nice, uh, the gravel pit is, is sorted out. So that's always, this, every time, no matter what it is, you ask yourselves, how do we put parties in a position as if there had been no breach? Uh, just a couple of uh, sort of things on this. So that's the general principle, Robinson Harmon, and uh, that's basically the, the the benefit you lost. So we could say that's the the expectation, the interest. We we called it that. What if um, it's not that you lose your benefit, but you put in money expecting the contract to go ahead? Okay, then we. Uh, have a something called reliance interest. So we had the case of Anglia TV and Oliver Reed, where Oliver Reed was this actor, and he said, "Hey, I'm going to film this show with you guys." And then he opted out and said, "Oh, I'm, I changed my mind." Well, Anglia TV had invested money in anticipation of the show going ahead, so they rented a stage and they uh, bought equipment and all kinds of things, and that's they were able to reclaim for that because in reliance on the contract they had done things, bought things, spent money and we have to put them back in a position as if they hadn't done that. Okay, so that's uh, expectation interest versus reliance interest, just a sort of a small distinction there. Uh, we had Ruxley Electronics uh, which was the pool that was too shallow. So you were supposed to build a pool that was like six, six foot nine or whatever and then it turned out to be six foot six. Um, What's the compensation there? How do we put people in a position as if there had been no breach? Well, the main thing would be just to rip it all up and build a new pool. But in Ruxley, the, the court said, well, that would be going too far because we haven't had a total loss of whatever the contract was for. We just had a loss of amenity. So you have to then basically compensate the loss of amenity. And in this case, I think uh, Forsyth got some, some thousands of pounds. Now, how do you quantify the loss of amenity for a pool being, you know, a bit more shallow? This is very, very difficult. So you have to basically you're guided by the, uh, uh, by the, the case law and so on. It's a kind of a whole uh, special area of law to, to try and quantify these things. 
Uh, and then lastly, we had uh, on, on the topic of damages at common law, we had uh, remoteness, uh, Hadley Baxendale. Remoteness basically means you're, you can only claim for the damages which are which a common uh, sense approach, a reasonable person would anticipate there being. But if, for instance, like in Hadley Baxendale or in, in Victoria Laundries, if you had a situation where you would have extraordinary losses, because like, let's say in Victoria Laundries, if you don't get the new, uh, um, what was it, turbines, you're going to lose this, this new contract, okay? That's not the ordinary day-to-day -day thing. That's something on top. So if you want to claim for those something on top for, for extraordinary things that you anticipate are going to happen that, that are, you're going to lose, you have to let the other party know because otherwise it's too remote, hence remoteness. Okay, Equitable remedies, very simple. Um, there was basically three. There was rescission. We already know this from mistake and misrepresentation. Rescission basically means you go back in time. So instead of putting parties in a position as if the contract hadn't uh, had gone ahead as 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 normal that that's damages you put parties in a position as if the contract hadn't happened at all okay misrepresentation you just go back to the beginning obviously mistake void it didn't happen at all so that uh, there's a difference there uh, obviously with misrepresentation you know you can get both the uh, rescission as well as the uh, the damages uh, the other two we had was specific performance and injunctions, which kind of are two sides of the same coin. Specific performance, uh, you bought a painting, you want the painting, you don't want money because it's a unique painting. The court can order specific performance whereby the, the, the seller has to give you the painting instead of giving you compensation in terms of money. Okay, specific performance. Uh, injunction, um, you, you're stopped from doing something. So let's keep with the painting example. So in the painting example, the seller would be stopped. There would be an injunction against the seller selling the painting to someone else. That's an injunction. All right, and lastly, uh, quantum merit, which we actually had a question about. How does it work with, quant uh, with um, how does quantum merit work? So quantum merit is basically how much does someone deserve? Now, this is when it's neither a loss of the contract nor when there is there's no breach. It's sort of a middle thing. Hence, it's called quasi-contractual remedy. Um, and and the, the, that's the one we're looking at, quantum merit. So basically, it's partial payment, partial remuneration for partial performance. So how does it work? Well, first of all, it depends on the contract itself. So in Cutter and Powell, this, this, this poor sailor, he died seven weeks into a 10-week journey. Normally, under quantum merit, the guy would be able, or his widow would be able to take seven weeks pay, because at least for seven weeks he had rendered the work. But in the end, the uh, court only awarded, uh, actually the court awarded nothing. That's because the contract had specifically stated the journey must be completed. Okay, If the contract had not said, said that, then under quantum merit, the guy would have gotten seven weeks pay out of the 10, because after all, he did that work. Uh, Sumter and Hedges, the builder, had done some of the work, but he hadn't finished building the house as he was supposed to. What did he deserve? Again, quantum merit. What do you deserve? What the guy? What does the guy deserve? He didn't do the contract, so you could argue, well, he shouldn't get anything. But under quantum merit, he got something, which is he got the cost of all his materials, although he didn't get the cost of his his labor. Okay, so. Um, Quantum merit is a sort of, again, you've got to look at the cases for guidance, but most of all, just sort of take a common sense approach because it, it is, I mean, it, it, the, the term quantum merit already expresses it. How much does someone merit? How much do they deserve? So you just kind of think about it in, in those terms. All right, that's pretty much it in terms of what we were going to um, do this morning. Let me just go through and see if we had any other questions here. Um, I, okay, I'll just give you a few moments to see if there's any more questions. So, thanks very much for your interest to this point. Uh, just because we're going to end this uh, this stream doesn't mean you you, you know you can't uh, still ask questions or whatever. You send me your questions, or some 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 of you send me your uh, kind of you know sample essays or whatever. That's that's totally fine, and you do that, and then I'll I'll send it back with uh, with comments. You make it a lot easier if you send it to me in some sort of word processed format. And then all I have to do is, is put little notes uh, as, as I go through it. So you're very welcome to do all those things, ask questions uh, anytime, no problem at all. All right, thanks very much for your interest. Take care.